Hi, I'm Sean McCutcheon and welcome to my channel. Today's video is going to be a little different from what I normally plan on posting. Uh, normally this channel is going to be about how we can solve a lot of the political and social issues that are facing our society and how we can come together to, to face a lot of them. This one's going to be different. This one's going to be more of a personal nature, um, one that hopefully um, will provide a lot of the same support for people out there that has been provided for me. So for those of you who don't know, I am the primary caregiver for my wife who has cancer, okay? Um, and I also have two teenage children uh, for which I'm also raising. Uh, and because of that, I have, you know, picked up a lot of tips and tricks on how to be a good husband throughout this process. Um, what are some things that I can do as a father to help them and support them and encourage them throughout this time? And I thought I would, you know, share them here so that hopefully you can benefit from the same lessons uh, that I've learned for the past several years. Okay. Um, if you have any questions, any comments below, you know, please let me know. Uh, I'm going to break this video up into multiple sections. The first section is going to be on uh, caregiver tips. So tips that I've learned on how to be a better caregiver. The second one is going to be on kind of how to help a caregiver, right? So if, you know, you, you, because of my situation, I know a lot of people that are in similar situations, right? Um, who have a family member or a loved one that is, is struggling with cancer, who is, is doing their best, right? But what are some ways that you can help those people out if you're not like the primary caregiver or if maybe you're not like someone super close to them? Uh, the next one is going to be on how to, you know, support your children during this time, how to help them, how to, you know, um, make sure that they get through this with the minimal amount of trauma. <laughs> and um, the, the, the understanding that, it, and, and, and kind of keeping their world as intact as, as it can be uh, through this whole process. Um, lastly, and as every caregiver will understand why this is last, uh, will be tips on taking care of yourself. Um, because at, at the end of the day, that, that, that tends to fall by the wayside sometimes, but we, we can't let it, um, as, as I get yelled at many times, you cannot pour from an empty glass. Uh, so you've got to find the little things, but anyway, so that's how the video is going to be broken up. I'm going to try to put on the timestamps. We'll see how close I get on those. Um, but here we go. So as far as being the caregiver, uh, a friend of mine illustrated to me something I thought was incredibly beneficial to this whole process, right? That there are, like, if you think of concentric circles and you think of the person that has cancer as being the very center of those circles, right? They're the one that we're all coming to support. They're the one that we're trying to help through this process, right? No matter how tired, how you know, depressed I get, I know that my wife is going through more, right? Um, with everything she has to go through, uh, with all of the treatments, all of the chemo, all of the surgeries, everything she has to go through, she's going through far more than I'm going through, right? Um, so that's why she's at the center circle, right? If you back out a ring, uh, typically that's where the primary caregiver goes. But in the instance of children, right, we have small children, they were nine when this process started, they're 13 now, um, that's kind of where they go, right? 
they are the ones that need, you know, support after the person because, of course, their kids, they're still developing. This is a, a very traumatic situation for them. This is something that, that, you know, we as parents need to help them and help guide them through. Um, then on the next string, of course, is you, right? You as the primary caregiver, you know, um, are on that next string. And, you know, because you're the one going through all the day to day, trying to make sure that um, everything gets done, food on the table, cleaned up, homework done, all that kind of fun stuff, right? Um, so then, of course, as you go further and further out, right, that is, again, the closeness and the level of care and support you need relative to that individual person with cancer, right? So for me, like I just described, I'm probably on that third ring, right? But for a lot of other friends and family, I'm on a far outer ring, right? But I still provide support to them. And we'll talk about some tips again in the second section. So this first tip that I got as a caregiver was frankly the, the first tip that was actually given to me um, with regards to what I specifically need to do um, to, to be a good husband, right? So whenever I first found out about my wife's cancer, I went to a friend of mine who I knew that their wife also had cancer, had a similar cancer to my wife's. And I wanted to know what to do to be a good husband, right? What, what can I do to help make her, this whole situation easier for her, right? The first thing that was told to me um, is don't use dark humor with them, right? And knowing me, that's why they said it, right? I enjoy dark humor, right? I, you know, gallows humor in, it is funny to me. It, it always has been due to, you know, a lot of different reasons probably many traumatic reasons, but, you know. <laughs> um, so this person was clear that that type of humor should not be used with my wife, right? And the reason why is that anything that, that is made along those lines gets internalized, right? And if I'm trying to help her, I'm trying to elevate her mood, you know, keep her in good spirits, right? A lot of that humor has to be, you know, directed elsewhere, right? Humor, laughter, joking, you know, watching funny things. That's all great, right? Still do that. You still have to keep their spirits up. You still have to motivate them because they're, they're, they're going to get tired mentally, physically. They're going to get tired, right? But keeping them in good spirits is, is a primary goal, right? Dark humor undermines that, right? Um, you know, she makes those jokes with me sometimes, but, you know, you can see it if you forget, when you forget, and you make those jokes back, you can see that it, it, it lands different, right? So you've got to remember, dark humor doesn't go in that direction right? Um, second big tip that I got uh, is for all of the medical appointments, you need to go with them and take notes, right? Medical appointments wasn't going to be a problem. The taking notes, that's really the point that, that you know, you need to take away something and, and what the real big gold nugget is of this, right? So, Taking notes, right? You, when you show up and the doctor comes in and talks to them, take notes about everything, right? Take notes about diagnoses. Take notes when they talk about treatment options, when they talk about treatment plans, when they talk about um, everything that's going on. Do not be afraid to ask stupid questions. I am a huge fan of the Colombo method of asking questions, which is 
appearing dumb so you can solve a case, right? When it comes to medical stuff, though, I don't have to appear dumb. I'm, in fact, very stupid when it comes to medical stuff. Uh, my wife is a nurse. Um, she's in there talking to doctors. And they're using all kinds of medical terminology. They're using all of the medical terms for treatment, for parts of the body. I, I don't... I don't know all of them. That's not my day job. That's not what I do. So I have no experience with that. So I have to ask some very, very basic questions. And I will grant you, the first time you ask those questions too, you may come across as stupid to the doctor. But let me tell you, that's okay. And they will understand. Because at the very end of that story, of every, every meeting with the doctor, you will go over those notes to make sure you hit everything, okay? That's when the doctor is going to understand what you're doing, why you're asking all these basic questions, right? They're going to, and then they're going to be grateful. The, the look of what is wrong with you turns into, oh, that's what you're doing, okay? So go over those notes with the doctor. Make sure you captured everything they said was important during that meeting, right? Make sure you captured it in a way that to a layman, it makes sense, right? So that when you walk out of there, when you have questions, they have questions, you know, you can answer them, right? Because in that room, even though my wife is a nurse and she understands all of these medical terms way better than I do, that is still one of the most important and most stressful times of her life, right? Because they're talking about her. They're talking about her life. They're talking about what they're trying to do to save her. So she's a little distracted. Her mind's in a not in the best place, right? Um, so that's why you're taking notes. I cannot emphasize this enough, right? So when you leave there, and there are questions, there will be questions, you can look back on notes that since you verified those notes with the doctor, they are authoritative notes. They know that those notes are what the doctor said and that can reassure them, right? Both about the quality of the notes, but about what was said in that, what was said and what was not said in that meeting, right? So now if they have a question, it's either answered on the notes or they know that they can save that question for next time. They know here is a better question that they can ask and go forward from there, right? The next section is going to be on how to help, how to help a caregiver, right? And this part is both for the caregivers and for the people that want to help a caregiver and subsequently help the person that has cancer, right? Um, first and foremost, do not compare trauma. That is always a terrible idea, right? Um, you, anyone, don't don't compare trauma. It 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 doesn't do you any good. It doesn't do the other person any good, right? There and and we're we're all gonna do it sometimes. So so you know, do understand that when you do it, okay, fine. It's a natural thing to do that sometimes, but it's not a good thing and you should stop, right? Because there are people that, 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 because pain is pain. Bottom line, pain is pain, right? You don't want to tell someone else that their pain doesn't matter or their pain is lesser, right? And you sure don't want to say to somebody else that, oh, your pain is greater and so therefore my pain, we can't talk about my pain. We can't deal with my pain, right? 
neither one of those things are healthy. Neither one of those things are good, right? You're damaging someone else. You're damaging yourself. This isn't good, right? Don't, don't compare trauma. Um, you're going to just remember it's a bad habit. Uh, for example, some wonderful friends of ours that we've made throughout this journey, um, they lost a son and, you know, we, Jen and I couldn't imagine going through that, right? Um, they have been some of the most compassionate people towards us, uh, imaginable, right? And the other day I was talking to them, right, about how I, I couldn't imagine what they went through. And it was turned around on us because, you know, I'm, I'm going through it with my wife and it's been going on for almost five years, right? Um, pain is pain. Remember to be compassionate. Be compassionate to the people that you deal with. Um, be compassionate to yourself. As a caregiver, that is hard to know, that's hard to remember sometimes, but be compassionate, right? Be empathetic and 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 help take care of people. I mean, if you're a caregiver, that's what you're doing. If you're watching this video, that's probably what uh what you're doing anyway. You're used to that. Um as a caregiver, right? Um, you need to remember that you can receive help as well right? You, you do not want to be a martyr. You, and, and I know I'm saying that, uh, you do not want to be a martyr, right? You are not to, to die, you know, valiantly in battle, you're taking care of someone, right? You are allowed to be cared for as well. You are allowed to ask for help. And there are people in your life that are, that are willing to help you. Right. Um, like I said, so God, everyone I have talked about so far in this video is someone that came into my life since Jen's diagnosis. And they mean so much to me. I can't, I, 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 I don't know where to begin. Right. Um, the, first person that I told about this cancer to was a co-worker of mine. Her and I had been working on something. She was a new employee to a former division I was in. And so she was looking for information on how to do some stuff in that old division. So I was talking to her about it. I got the phone call about Jen's diagnosis. She could tell something was wrong. She asked and I broke down. And she didn't go like, oh, oh, this is weird. I'm leaving now. Thank you. Um, you know, she stayed. Um, she's become one of my best friends. Uh, she's dropped off meals for us. She has, um, she gets along great with my daughter. She loves Jen, right? Um, people care. People want to help. You will build, you've got to put yourself out there, but you will build a support group. We'll talk about that in the self-care section, how to do that. But people care, people want to help, right? Um, I also let her know I was talking about her in this video because I thought it was funny. Along those lines, assume good intent. Right. When talking to other people, when interacting with other people, assume good intent. Not everyone's going to have good intent. All right. But assume it right right off the bat. Um, it's hard to do. Um, but assume good intent. Right. People don't know what to say to you during this time. Right. They 
they they don't they're afraid they're going to say the wrong thing you know or that you know they're going to trip over themselves that's okay so let them it's okay let them know it's okay right <laughs> it's because the effort they're putting in is valuable it's you know it, it's thoughtful they you know um and and people do care right so so listen to that intent behind it right um don't worry i'm not going total hippie like there's i i'm aware that people do have bad intentions we're going to talk about that in the self-care portion of this video um so what are ways that if you are like not that close but you do want to help somebody that you do know has cancer right or you want to help the caregiver you want to help the family you want to help them out well one way that is very helpful is providing food like i mentioned that one friend of mine that that you know she's provided food for us right a lot of these friends um let me stop there for a minute um providing you know gift cards for grocery stores gift cards for restaurants um you know bringing by food for them you know all of these things are really helpful ways to to provide support right uh they they kind of eliminate a task that has to get done anyway right and it relieves a lot of that mental burden that's on that family this is the way a lot of people do it right you'll see you know um people set up like meal organized meals for people after like births after deaths after like any kind of an event so that you know people know that they're being taken care of people know that they're being supported in a community right um same kind of deal right it's kind of the easiest thing to do um but don't get me wrong all because it's easiest does not mean it is not appreciated right um and does not mean it's not valuable it's very valuable it it, it really does take up you know it free up so much time and take care of so many needs right the another thing would be taking people to the medical appointments that i talked about earlier right so if you're able to drive somebody somewhere and you know take them to a medical appointments because there's so many medical appointments um that that will mean that they don't have to take off work right that they don't have to you know rearrange work schedules and you know try to you know do different things so that the person can go to you know um medical appointments right um yeah sorry just thinking to the fact that you know we we actually have several people that cover down on all of jen's medical appointments uh so that you know my sister-in-law she covers a lot of jen's appointments i cover a lot of jen's appointments that way neither one of us have to use all of our leave throughout the course of a year to to cover all of jen's medical appointments but if you do go to medical appointments do remember what i mentioned earlier about taking notes You've got to take notes. Those are very important. They are crucial to get those notes taken. Okay. Uh, last thing, uh, kind of off the top of my head. Oh, not off the top of my head, off of my script, right? Is childcare. We have had numerous friends that have taken our kids for the day, um, have taken them to go do things. And that has freed up just so much time for us to do things, right? Do things around the house, relax, right? Um, reconnect, go to the aforementioned medical appointments, right? Um, Childcare is a really important thing, just coming in, stepping up. They, they, we have several friends that they love going over to their house, love spending time with them. That is a huge way to help, right? There are countless other ways to help. Um, if you 
I, I would caution though, if, if you're not that close with a person, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend going off of this list of things because uh, they're, they're like, I have a friend of mine. If I, when I need very technical assistance, I call him, right? When I am having trouble with a build, which rarely happens, I call him, right? He's, he's the person I go to whenever I, I need that, um, like specialized tools and, you know, all kinds of things that can lift heavy objects that need to be precariously hung and all sorts of fun widgets. He's a blacksmith and all sorts of fun things. So, of course, I call him. Um, but like the aforementioned friends that I was laughing about some of the stories and, hey, I'm going to get distracted later. Uh, they helped us move, right? Uh, they helped us go from one house to another, right? They, they, you know, one, the friend of mine, I told you that I first talked about, she's helped me clean my garage, right? But A, I'm not going to ask anybody to do that. And B, if, even if some people offered to do that, I would probably say no, right? So anything that's like not on that list of things that I said, it, it all depends upon the relationship that you have with the person, how well they know you, how well you know them. And of course, what kind of skill set you can provide, right? One thing we found super helpful was creating a playlist for the person, right? A musical playlist that of songs that they can listen to while they're going through chemo because uh, they're going to be sitting in that chair for quite a while. This is also something you can involve other people in uh, that you can ask for help with that if you have more musically inclined friends that they can make recommendations to the playlist and kind of build it up. Now, we, like most people that go through this, titled our playlist, Fuck Cancer, right? And Jen had a great time listening to it. What this needs to consist of is fight music. Music that gets you pumped up. Think about if you're walking into the ring, what music do you want playing on the, out of the you know, huge speakers to the entire audience cheering you on? That's the music you want playing because you need to keep the spirits up. You need to keep people elevated. You need to keep them going so that they can stay motivated through this entire process. Cause again, it's hard and it's demoralizing and it's painful. So you need something to hype them up. Part of it is being a hype man or a woman. And you know, your friends can sometimes really help you along with coming up with music and a playlist that'll encourage that. Now we're on to the section about children, right? Do be aware this video is not on how to talk to your kids about cancer, right? Um, there are plenty of different videos on YouTube. Um, there are books. Talk to the hospital if need be about how you talk to your specific kids about cancer. That is not what this video is about because it all has to do with the age and maturity levels of your children about how you talk to your children about cancer, right? Especially if it's cancer in a parent, okay? When our kids first heard of Jen's diagnosis, they were nine, right? The language we used, the uh, imagery we used, the um, everything we used to talk about her cancer was very different from now when they're 13 and they're almost five years into this process, right? Their age has changed, their maturity has changed, their understanding of, of cancer and what it does, what it is, has changed. So we can have a more in-depth conversation with them 
about everything going on, right? Now, understand that all because language changed when they were nine to 13, the truth was still there, right? Um, here is something that's, that's Im important to understand. You, you need to tell the truth. No matter what language you couch it in, whether it's language for a small child, language for a teenager, language for an adult, you need to tell the truth, right? Because you don't want, you don't want your children feeling like you lied to them, okay? As an example, one of my kids, we <clears throat> had to go to the hospital in the middle of the night couple of years ago and she had been having you know a real easy time sleeping through the night she happened to wake up that night and we were gone well we never lied to her we left for the hospital after she went to bed there was an emergency after everyone was asleep we didn't wake anybody up we left well, technically, we woke up my sister-in-law to let her know and whatever. Um, that next morning, or a year or so after that, she had trust issues. She had to come and check on us to make sure we were there that night. Understandably, because we weren't there. Ultimately, we had to promise to her that if that ever happened again, we would wake her up. We would let her know that we were going somewhere. Not that she would come with us. No. <laughs> um, but we would let her know what was going on. Doing that later on when there was a medical emergency and in the middle of the night, because of course, we went and we woke her up. We're like, okay, here's what's going on. We're ha there is an emergency. You are awake. You are now with the adults as we take care of this emergency. Right? And by this point in time, she was 11 or 12. Uh, and, you know, here's what's going on. She didn't like it. She didn't like that there was an emergency. But she came to understand and trust that if there is an emergency, we will get her. Right? She will not be abandoned and that we will get her. Okay? That that, that trust was built back up. We had to have other awkward conversations, but that trust was built back up. It is, it is hard to do that, but that's why telling the truth is important because you want to make sure that they maintain trust with you. And the reason why is they are going through, like we talked about at the beginning, one of the most difficult times of anyone's life. And they're going through it as a child. So instead of getting to do all of the normal, regular kid stuff that all kids should be able to do, no, they have to, you know, watch as this thing hurts one of their parents. So they need to understand that home and you are a place of trust. So this will help in teaching them resiliency, right? Ultimately, that's where you're going with all of this is teaching these kids how they can cope with this very stressful situation get through everything and come out a functioning adult 
hopefully that's where we're going. It's two functioning adults. So far, they're pretty amazing teenagers. I'm hoping to get two functioning adults. I'll let you know in 20 years. Speaking of resiliency, they have to learn that home is a safe place to express their emotions, their hard emotions. Because like everyone else, they're going to be asked to kind of refrain from expressing those emotions like when they're in school, right? When they're going someplace that needs them to be on their better behavior, they need to know that there is a safety release valve when they come home. So, so far that's worked, right? Sometimes it is hard. I know that as an adult. I sometimes get frustrated. I sometimes cry at work, right? I sometimes get, you know, really sad and have to walk away. I sometimes get angry when I'm outside of the house, right? They will too sometimes. But they also need to know that when they come home, when they express that anger, when they express that sadness, when they express those rough emotions, that it is a safe place for them to express those rough emotions and that they can express them with you and to you and you will help them through those emotions, okay? Because a very important thing that I know we've been working with our kids on, and, and I <clears throat> got it from somebody else. These are all, again, lessons from somebody else. I think I came up with zero of them, right? That helping our kids feel an emotion, right? You feel that fear, you feel that anger, you feel that sadness, you feel that anxiety, but you don't live there. You don't live in fear. You don't live in anxiety. You don't live in sadness. You don't live there. You feel that emotion. You know, you embrace what it is trying to tell you, what it is going to give you, and then you let it go and you keep living your life. Okay. Their mom, Jen, wants them to keep living their lives, wants them to become the amazing people that they are, wants them to continue being the amazing people that they are, and doesn't want them to, you know, be held back, you know, by everything going on. Now, of course, that may be an unrealistic expectation, but wants them to be fully productive and fully capable and strong human beings. Okay. Now, one thing to do with that, one way to help teach that to your kids is to model that behavior yourself. They don't need to see you break down and cry. They don't need to see you screaming in the car by yourself. Who does that? But they need to know that you do it. Tonight, this week, I have been dealing with a lot of depression. I have been dealing with a lot of really bad emotions relating to everything going on right now. And that's because we're going through another fun cycle of stuff. I talked to my kids because they were having a really rough night because, of course, they had all day to work on their homework and they didn't. And dad came home and dad was like, do your homework. And. Again, it's been a very stressful time for all of us, but 
me coming down hard on them kind of lit those, those gates overflowed right of, of with emotion and so we had to have a lot of conversations about how they were feeling and i told them when i went upstairs to get changed i took a few minutes and i just breathed right and i didn't do anything else i just sat and breathed because that's all i could do and it helped me get back to a place where i wasn't as angry i wasn't depressed i wasn't being overwhelmed by all these emotions and hearing that of course i still have to do it so that they can learn to do it themselves one quote that i absolutely love uh, from the film rocky balboa the title character rocky balboa uh, he is giving to his son a a speech and talks about how you know nothing hits harder than life right no matter how hard you hit right and and for like the three of you that may not know rocky is a very uh played by sylvester stallone as a famous movie boxer so he's well known for hitting things very hard and getting punched very hard so the point of the story is that nothing hits harder than life the point isn't to see if you can hit harder than life it's that when life hits you and you get knocked down your ass and you get knocked down you have to get back up you have to get back up you have to move forward you have to keep going you can not let life knock you on your ass and then you just stay there you've got to get back up and ultimately that's what we're trying to teach our kids because right now life is knocking them on their ass right for the for the past like five years life's been knocking all of us on our ass but all of us have had to learn to get back up and keep moving forward and that's what we're trying to teach the kids. Okay. Another thing to include is counseling. It was a super obvious one that I didn't include because I forgot about it the first go round. But if your kids need counseling or if you need counseling, do go get that help, uh, get that support. Um, it is, it is very needed. It is necessary. It is very helpful for them and for you uh, to get through this whole process because it is difficult. One of the things I forgot to talk about in the resiliency section is that early on, I introduced my kids to horror, right? So the horror genre, and of course, we've done age-appropriate horror things like uh, scary movies scary tv shows uh scary novels uh, haunted houses those types of things part of the reason we introduced that fairly early and they've been doing it since they were about 10 years old is to help them learn how to deal with those emotions of fear anxiety uh in a safe and controlled environment right so they know what those feelings are like and know that those feelings, at least for what we're doing, are temporary and controlled. Uh, haunted houses, they know no one's going to touch them. They know everyone's an actor. They know they can leave whenever they want. Movies and TV shows, uh, they know they can be paused. They know they can be stopped. They know that they can stop and talk about whatever they're going through and things like that. These safe, controlled things are really helpful for them kind of learning about these complex emotions. Now, 
going back to the part about trust, the kids have to know that they can trust you with their emotions and trust that as they're going through this, it's a safe place. Okay. And they need to, they need to feel safe, of course, with this uh, and through this process. And this will help them learn again, how to deal with this emotion. And again, that you are a safe and trustworthy place to have these hard emotions. Again, it also trusts them to feel these emotions without necessarily living in these emotions. Touching on the trust issue with horror, the kids know what I'm doing, right? One of my kids is more logically minded and didn't want to watch horror. The other one was very much a big fan of it and was all in on doing it. Uh, but he was very apprehensive about watching it, getting started in it. Uh, but once he found out that the reason we're doing it is so that he can learn how to feel these complex emotions in a safe place uh, without fear of judgment or, or fear that it's going to continue on, he understood that, okay, this is why we're doing it. It is so that we can learn emotional resiliency, even if he didn't understand it in quite those terms. You'll notice an abrupt shift in the recording at this point. As I was reviewing everything, I noticed that the vast majority of the section on self-care got cut out, uh, which I, you know, poured my heart into, you know, of course, that's when I got a little emotional and stuff like that. So, of course, all of the, you know, sound went out and the video looked kind of crappy at that point, too, you know, more so than normal. Um, so this is not quite editing me. This is five minutes later me. I uh, just wanted to cover what that section was. So when caring for yourself, you know, there are some very important steps to take, right? Um, first and foremost is empathy, right? Care about yourself. You cannot fill from an empty cup. I get yelled at about that on a regular basis from my wife who correctly points this out to me. If I don't take care of myself, I cannot take care of her and I cannot take care of our children, right? The same applies to you. If you do not take care of yourself first, you are not going to be able to take care of other people, right? My wife actually prefers the, you have to put your mask on first before you take care of everyone else on the airplane. Speaking of filling your cup, a lot of the things I'm going to recommend, I'm sure this isn't the first time you've heard it, and I'm sure being a caregiver, you're absolutely on top of this and 100% doing all of these things. The first one I'm going to mention is getting a good night's sleep. I'm sure all of you are doing that, and I'm sure I shouldn't have been in bed two hours ago. I also do this after everyone goes to bed because it's the only time I get any peace and quiet in the house. As any caregiver knows, you generally aren't going to get as much sleep as everybody else anyway, so it's okay. Um, going to the gym, you know, reading, find something that you can do that helps to you know, de-stress you, that you can kind of, you know, let go for a little bit, playing video games, something, right? Something that helps you kind of unwind and de-stress. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I took a few minutes while getting changed to just sit in my closet, the lights off, and just breathe, right? Um, I will generally blare music on the car ride home. You know, there have been times in which I've screamed in the car, you know, gone away to a quiet corner and cried for a few minutes. Showers are great for crying. You know, if, if you need, if, if, if you need to let the emotion out and it's a safe time to do it, do it right. Just like you're telling your kids, if you don't let it out when you're in a safe place, it's going to come out when it shouldn't. Right. If I don't let it out, let the valve let some steam off 
when it is okay, then it's going to burst at the wrong time. So you've got to take care of yourself. Okay. And you've got to let those emotions out before they overwhelm you. Find a support group. As I talked about, there are lots of people that I never interacted with. I rarely interacted with prior to this. Uh, there is the best friend of mine that I mentioned that I only, you know, casually knew beforehand. And now she's helped me move. She's provided us food. She's good friends with Jen, right? Like this is, you know, th there are people out there that are willing to help, right? And, and be kind of that support group that you need. Um, there are online communities that help as well. Um, obvious ones like, you know, subreddits um, that are for cancer caregivers. Uh, less obvious ones like my guild in World of Warcraft when I used to play. Uh, they were very supportive of me and understood actually why I had to leave the game because I've got enough going on. I didn't have time to play and dedicate to it as much as I would have liked to. Um, so do check those things out right? Again, assume good intent, have empathy with other people, have empathy with yourself. Um, again, you know, I talked about earlier, I'm not that naive. I know some people are going to be just the worst, right? Um, some people I thought were in my support group very much are not in my support group because when given the chance to, you know, express care or empathy they 100% uh, made sure that they did not so okay since your life is now pretty much taken over by care caring for someone and you know you don't have time for that anymore so if they're toxic just cut them out you don't have time you don't have energy for that anymore in the long run it will save you and in the short term, it will also save you. So just cut them loose, right? Um, it's sad, but it'll be helpful. Uh, I think that's it. I think that's all I missed. I really couldn't even hear myself um, in the other video. Um, do take care of yourself. Do you know that people care about you? Um, I do. I care enough about whatever you're going through to put all my pain out here on YouTube, right? Uh, so do reach out. Uh, if there's any other comments, suggestions, tips, please put those in the comments below. I am not, nothing I have mentioned is an original idea from this brain, right? I got these as tips from other people that have been through this. So please share other tips that you have maybe they'll help me out. Maybe you'll help each other out. That would be great, right? Um, so the, just as a little point of bragging, being a bragging dad, the title card of this was inspired by a drawing that my daughter did. Uh, she's very, both, both of my kids are very excited about me starting a YouTube channel. And they very much want to take as much of an active role in this as they can. You will never see them on screen. <laughs> Not putting my teenage children on the internet. Um, so that title card was inspired by some drawings that she did. Uh, the drawings that she did are actually going to be uh, behind me on the uh, rear card. So before that, uh, I'm going to post like the pictures that she's done so that you have an opportunity to see those. I uh, hope you enjoy them. Have a great night. Have a great day. Um, take care of yourself and good luck. Good night.